Hey everyone, welcome to Dreadnought Mondays. Excited to be here today. We are here with Robert Toll. Look forward to this. Robert, thank you for taking the time to be here. We appreciate it. Um, if you wouldn't mind, introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit of a background and um, who you are. Yeah, that's great. Well, it's great to be here, Kenny. I really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, so my name is Rob Toll and I am a success coach, author, and speaker um, as kind of the new section of my life of living into what I call Pack 2. Uh, which is the name of my business. Um, but I'm still also uh, an executive at a financial services firm. I've spent over 20 years doing that stuff. Um, kind of came in through office land and bought into the same story that kind of all of us are sold through every institution we pass through, which is uh, don't worry about today, just focus on the end result. So in school, it was grades and you got good grades to get a good job and all that stuff. And, and I fell into the same trap and, uh, I, I found out that the path I was on was a was literally a dead end, and so I needed to figure out how to shift gears and, and and finally pursue what I wanted to without losing everything that I had. Um, and so that's that's what kind of set me off on my journey. And so now I get a chance to live my passion, which is sharing information and and speaking and connecting with people while still doing the job that I thought was the only path for me to follow. So that, that's a little bit about me. Awesome. That's awesome. Well, again, appreciate you being on here. And um, something that you brought up, you know, that, um, and we were talking a little bit about off camera that, um, you know, you help people overcome the feeling of being stuck you yeah. know, or the lack of choice or, um, you know, not being able to do anything until a certain thing happens or a certain point in time or a certain milestone is reached, whatever, you know, and in your introduction, you mentioned, um, a job being a dead end, you know, and <clears throat> a dead end is, could be a good thing in the fact that, you know, you, if you realize it's a dead end, you could turn around and go a different road. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, um, you know, also a lot of us are on a um, <clears throat> hamster wheel where we think we're moving, but it's in ways worse than finding a dead end because, yeah, you're just doing the same thing over and over again and not realize you're going nowhere or yep. if you realize you are going nowhere, not knowing how to get off that hamster wheel and change that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's, that's real important. It, it takes a lot to realize that. And then when you finally do realize that it takes even more to know how to do anything about it. So, yeah. Um, it, it in my own life, it felt like my goals were all, it felt like what I was working toward kept moving farther and farther away. Like so every time I took a step forward and advanced to the next part of my life, like, hey, as soon as I get this promotion, I'll be that much closer to what I want. Or as soon as this, as soon as the kids are done school this spring, this is when I can start doing this. So every time I, I made that progress, the goal moved, it felt like it moved farther away. And so I did, I absolutely had that hamster wheel feeling of just constantly running. And then there was a breaking point where it was, oh, by the way, like there was the realization of, by the way, you're never going to get there. And that was, that was a huge revelation for me. That, that's kind of what I would, would call my dead end moment. And it was more internal. Awesome. So when people realize that, whether um, through their internal or through external sources saying, you know, your boss is saying, hey, you're never going to go anywhere or media or whatever, um, <clears throat> how do you help people? be able to um, change that in a positive way instead of, you know, sticking their head in the ground, you know, well, I'm, I'm never going anywhere. I just might as well sit on the couch the rest of my life or right. you know, continue that downward spiral. No, totally. And, and, and so there's kind of like two parts to it. So the first part is being able to identify what's going on. Right. And so it's that idea of what are the symptoms of feeling stuck? Like when, you, when you're, you know, miserable, you're stressed, your, your health starts to go, your relationships suffer, there's distancing. And so you get all these kind of symptoms that are throwing back at you saying, hey, there's a problem. Like you are not happy, you are unfulfilled, and you're not seeing options, right? So it's kind of like, can you identify that? So once we identify that and somebody can say, yeah, I'm suffering from those things. Like I, I dread going to work. I don't like the idea that I feel like I can't make progress on anything. I resent people that feel like they have their stuff together. So first it's that kind of identification. And then the second thing is, well, why did you start this to begin with? 
why did you take this job? Why did you enter this relationship? Why did you start this project? What was your intent? And a lot of times our goals get defined as objective things, right? So, well, I, got, I took this job because eventually I'd get this promotion and make this money. So the goal becomes that progression, that external thing. And so what I like to do is push through that. And it's a little bit of like process improvement mentality, which is like asking the why. And it's, well, why did you want that? Why did you want that job? Why did you want that money? Because that's the real thing that's driving you. And so what happens is a lot of people think, and this I'll speak to my own circumstance. I thought by being the ultimate provider for my family and being the best there was at what I did, that you know I would be satisfied. And if I would be, be satisfied, I'd then be happy. Well, I did those things, but it always felt like the goal, like the mountain got bigger and bigger and bigger, the higher I went up. And so it was like this insurmountable thing where I would never be good enough. And so, but I was like, oh no, if I'm never good enough, I'll never feel happy. And then that was this huge problem. And so what I realized was I put happiness as a condition of those goals. Like they were sequential and causal. And until I was able to disconnect that and kind of decouple those two concepts and say, wait a second, happiness exists in all these other aspects of my life that I can use for happiness. And what that was able to do is you dial down the pressure on the job. So the job feels like a barrier to what you want. And when you're able to remove it and say, no, I can still get what I want, it suddenly changes the entire complexion of the job or whatever that hamster wheel is, whether it's a relationship, a, a business, whatever, when we remove the emotional piece from the consequence of it, then it suddenly is no longer this thing that we resent. And we can approach it with like a, a clear perspective and say, okay, here's how I can approach my job. So that's really what the focus is. Is It's not like, oh, you got to quit your job and run off and join the circus. It's you need to identify what's not being satisfied internally that you think is going to be at some later point. And let's start doing that now. And then suddenly that ch it changes everything. And so that's, that's kind of a thumbnail of the aspect of um, kind of rerouting around the dead end or, or, or kind of punching through. Awesome. I like that. You know, I like, um, it, it ties into, you know, um, putting, internalizing and defining, putting your own definition on it. You know, whatever that, that goal, that happiness is. Like you said, you know, I'll be happy when, or my family will be satisfied or provided for when, 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 you know, but is that your definition of when, or is that, you know, what um, society determines, you know, you, you get to this point before you're successful, you know, or whatever, but at the same time, at, to what expense, you know, I was working a business for a while and I was bringing in good money and stuff, but my family suffered, you know, that they were still being provided for and stuff, but I was missing out on everything, you know, so, so I'm like, okay, this isn't working because this is not worth this to me, right. you know, so I cut back on what I brought in, you know, or whatever. I made some changes and I was able to be happy, you know, true happy, you know, and not what everybody else says is happiness. Or right. satisfaction. You know, Correct. So I was able it, to go ahead. No, no, no. I was gonna say that you're you're hitting on it perfectly, which is that idea of if everybody else says it. So there's a question of what's driving you internally, right? Like so what is driving somebody internally? In my own case, it was my own, you know, self inadequacy or my own self shame that was always comparing myself to the Joneses. And it's not because I wanted to be better to the Joneses. I wanted to know I was just as good, that I was on equal footing. And so I always felt like I was lagging. And so I would go to conferences, I'd go to work, and whatever it was, I would always find the people in the room I was trying to aspire to be. But what was really like a, a problem for me, it became a poison for me, is where the, the mentality of there's always somebody, there's always someone older, there's always someone farther ahead. And it was, oh, I'm lagging. And that sense of lagging, is really what kind of creates that essentially it basically forms coal that you just stick in the furnace and it makes you work harder and harder and harder and harder and the goal just keeps moving away so that was kind of my own path and, and everything along there all the symptoms of being stuck in other words i was stuck in this mode and i was stuck because i felt like i had no options 
over the course of time, um, it, it polluted and contaminated all of my relationships. And so you saw it happen with dysfunction with kids. You saw it happen with dysfunctions with a spouse, dysfunctions with friends, and then, just, you know, and, and clearly dysfunction with myself. So I was totally miserable. Then what happened was when all those things fail, right? So all along, I, I keep thinking I'm driving forward based on a goal and based on a mission, how I want to feel. At some point, you lose discretion. And what happens is when you abuse the choices you have, in other words, you make poor choices, eventually those choices go away. And that's what happened to me is I, I essentially lost the marriage, lost the kids, everything stopped. And then what was worse was I, I kind of viewed the job as this never ending hamster wheel, um, you know, like, like you described. But then it was, by the way, when you're losing all these things, you can now never leave your job. So that feeling of being stuck became truly trapped and that kind of it that elevates pressure so suddenly it feels like now there's no options whereas before it was kind of like i'm continuing to do this because i want something and now it's a question of well now you feel like you can't do anything else and so that changed the complexity of that feeling of stuckness where it went from just being oh i'm stuck in this job that's not giving me what i want to now I'm stuck in this job and I can't even have the stuff that I thought, the, the, the stuff that I had and wasn't really paying attention to, the, the family, the kids and all that stuff. Now I don't have that. And so now I don't have my future goal and I don't have my current, my present state. So that was really kind of the, the inflection point of something needed to change. Like the whole approach was wrong of setting my emotional goals after objective criteria. Um, but it was a system that, I bought into really early on. I bought into it, you know, all the way from elementary school forward. And it's that idea of chase the best grades, chase the best things, and you get rewarded. And, and hey, if you want good opportunities, you need to perform well. And it was, it's that whole ethos that just kind of builds up around it. And then it's, you, you, you know, you can find yourself stuck in it. And that, that's exactly where I found myself. Awesome. Yeah, I think that, that ties in exactly what I was describing where you start out at the the hamster wheel, you know, continually chasing, then you get to that point like you described where you're reaching that dead end and everything else, all the other options and motives are gone, you know? Mm -hmm. So you can get to that point and either A, just sit there and do nothing or B, turn around and go find another avenue. Correct. So yeah. in, a, in a sense, a dead end could be a good thing if, you, if oh. you're looking at it with the right mentality. Oh, totally. And that was, and that really caused for, for me, like that process, when someone's at that stage of, wow, I feel stuck. I feel like there's no options. All the things I've been working for are no longer possible. Um, it was really taking an inventory of, well, what did you, what did you want, Rob? Like to break it apart and say, there's the objective goals and then there's the emotional qualities. And the emotional qualities is where all the pain comes from, right? The reason I was working my ass off and like destroying family is because I was trying to satisfy some inner drive, some inner, some inner deficiency that wasn't met through all these other things. So I had to step back and say, of all the goals you've outlined, what's really important behind each one? Like, what's it trying to satisfy? And then start to address those things right away. Because then I had a choice. Because once I removed, you know, my sense of fulfillment or my sense of happiness from behind the goal of, you know, being a global executive at my firm, well, now I don't, there's no pressure to be that global executive because now I can go out and satisfy happiness someplace else. And then I have a choice of, so do you like this job, Rob? If you do, keep it. If you don't like it, start to look elsewhere because now my identity, it wasn't such a high stakes game where it was, oh my God, you can't leave this because it'll prove you're a failure. It'll prove you're not good enough. So getting that, when, when someone's at that stopping point, it's really looking through and saying, what is it you want from your life? And let's go address that right now. And what was interesting is I had to solve that. And so, you know, the question of, well, when are you happy? Like, what makes you happy? And a lot of people say, oh, you know, or you say like, oh, friends and family. It's just kind of like a thumbnail. So what I had to do was find a way to prove it empirically, like study it and say, okay, well, what do I even think happiness is? I've seen a picture of it, but do I really know what it is for me? And so really understanding that of, oh yeah, it's that time I was in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And I remember sitting where I was and that feeling of happiness or it's at the beach and it's at the beach when this is happening and when I'm doing something. 
And so you kind of, I, I made a master list of all the times I felt happiness and then said, okay, of all the times I felt it, what were some of the ingredients? Oh, look, every time I felt it, I was outside. Maybe that's important to me. Maybe being locked in an office for 15 hours a day isn't really healthy and didn't contribute positively to my wellness, you know? And so it's, it's really deconstructing those little things and finding the clues and then saying, okay, now can I address those things? And, and satisfy my emotional qualities and not have to blow up my life. Because oftentimes when people hit that wall, the, that path, it seems like everything is wrong. And so they, they kind of get into that mode of destroying everything. And that's where you get like, where people leave their families in the middle of the night, or you get people that kind of quit their job and Jerry Maguire, the whole thing. Like that's where those things happen. And that's not necessary for someone to get the, the emotional qualities that they need. They don't need to burn everything down. They just need to be able to understand what's driving them, like what emotional need is driving them, and then figure out how to address it based on where, they, where they've been able to address it in the past, if that makes sense. It does. It does. It comes down to, you know, just breaking it down, like you said, and getting real clear on what your goal is and even some of the behind why, you know. <clears throat> You know, because like you said, you could fulfill it in multiple places sometimes or different ways or whatever, you know. Um, so what what is usually like the next step after that? They've identified some goals or whatever. Like when you started that rebuild process, you know, how did you continue on that path instead of just going, um, you know, the Joneses, I'm, I'm too far behind the Joneses. Whatever the, the new Joneses is for you you know, or that goal is, you know, um, I'm, I'm too far down. I'll never get there anyways. Why bother? You know, you, yeah. you've turned around, but you're still looking up at the mountain or whatever. And you're like, no, no way. <laughs> right. Oh, no, absolutely. So a big part of that was trying to say, it was really identifying what was, what was the pain in the first place? Like, so for me, I was in a job that was, you know, extremely technical, uh, very high stress, and, and I'm still in that job, but it's not high stress right now. And it's not as, as um, limiting as it was before because my, the quality of my life doesn't depend on it. And what I mean is the quality of my emotional life. There's still the financial reward. So when I did that, I said, okay, what are the things that I'm lacking that, that I'm not getting from the job and that I'm, I desperately need in my life so I can function properly and not continue to, to cause problems places. And so it was that sense of fulfillment. It was a sense of purpose. It was really, I'm a server. I'm, I'm naturally a servant person. Like in leadership roles, I'm a servant leader. I like to be a helper. Um, and there is a, a lot of suffocation of, wow, I don't feel like I'm making a difference. You know, especially if you're trapped in a financial services firm, it's like, you don't, you know, you're not dealing with people. It's, you don't feel like you, your life has a purpose. At least it's a, it's a common feeling. Um, and so what I did said, okay, how do I exercise that muscle? What, what do I do to start to impact people in a way that I feel valued, I feel value for myself. And then how do I balance that with my work-life balance? Is that something that becomes my profession? Or is it I keep my profession and learn how to do this kind of in the margins of my life? But I really had to break down that in the margins of my life. What I did was I actually smash the two things together. I said, I'm not gonna separate you know, the two realms. I'm gonna keep them integrated. And, and by doing that allowed me to capitalize on stuff like, like coaching and being able to interface with people and really hear them and see them and then help them. So what I had to do though, in order to do that was understand what, what my emotions and what those experiences translated to, right? So if I could say, I like being outside, I like helping people. It's then a question of, okay, well, in what capacity? So I had to ask myself that next, you know, not necessarily why, but how, and it was, well, I like to be emotionally supportive of people. Because I could like to help people and want to be a nurse, you know, help them physically. But no, I like more the mental, emotional side. Okay, so doing, if I wanted to be an EMT on the side, that doesn't satisfy the same need. I, you know, I wanted to go on the emotional side. And I like stories. Okay, well, what do you like about stories? I like hearing people's stories and understanding the color behind them. Okay, so now you're talking about real personal contact, not just, you know, um, a distance kind of engagement. So I had to go through and look at all those individual pieces. And then I say, okay, of all the, it's like a Lego set, right? I've got all these pieces in front of me. What can I build with it? 
And it was, okay, I can help people through coaching. I can write. I can do that stuff. Now, can I do that in my life? Do I have to make changes to my career? Do I have to make changes to my living situation or whatever it is? But what it allowed me to do was when I could start to address that thing that was a need in me, I had a much clearer perspective of opportunities um, that didn't exist before. You know what I mean? Like suddenly I was optimistic because I was addressing something. And what didn't happen was I didn't generate more coal to stuff in the furnace that then made me work my ass off and get super competitive with the Joneses because now I didn't feel like I was lagging anything because I was addressing that emotional deficiency that brought me back up. So there wasn't a need to be like, oh, I've got to chase that or I've got to do this. Like I can tell you that like one of the things like as my life fell apart, so I used to have a Tesla and I was so in love with it. And it was, I, I had an, I had truly an emotional relationship with my car and I had to get rid of the, the Tesla. And so, and now I have a pickup truck and I'm, you know, I, I drive down the road and I see a Tesla and there's that kind of ping of, oh, I'm still in love with you because I know what it was like, but I don't want you right now. So there's this disconnect where it's not this like, oh, I need to have that because I will feel better. I can look at it through a different light and say, oh, I loved the experience of that and I missed that, but it doesn't change my value as a person. It doesn't make me want to now go work harder or take a new job to close the gap. And that, that to me was kind of the big signal of like, hey, you, you've changed. You've addressed something adequately. It's where, where's the real why in that need? Where does that need really fall? You know, you, you thought it was in that Tesla, but you realized it wasn't quite the need or you didn't need it like you thought you did at first. Right. Yeah. And um, you were also speaking on um, breaking things down, you know, or, you know, am I really making a difference when you were helping people emotionally and whatnot? You know, and um, that's something that I've had to learn quite a bit too. But something that I've found, you know, that that has helped is writing those those little things down, you know, if you're helping Bob over here and Bob can see you, oh man, that, that made a huge difference in my finances or whatever, you know, oh, awesome, Bob said this, you know, and then Mary said this, and then pretty soon you got to listen, like, I am making a difference, look at that. Yeah. You know, and it just, just um, a way to manifest to yourself that yes, you are making a difference, you know, not to use it to, to be cocky, like, look what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. You, you yeah, don't want to do that, of course, but yeah. you know, to to help you see the fulfillment that you're providing or to fill that need like you were saying. Yeah. And that's so that that's the example that you gave. Like so there's a couple tools that I use that I find very very effective. Um and one of them's a mission statement. So the idea of like making your own mission statement of what is it that you want from your life. And there's a, there's a kind of formula you can go through, but the main thing is this idea of writing it down, having it connect to your passion, like having it connect to the emotional qualities you want from life and revising it continually. And so what I find is, and it usually takes like, you know, 12 weeks for someone to really get kind of comfortable with their mission statement, but it's never fully done. And so, cause you know, we evolve as people, but that idea of like putting it down on paper, I do it on my phone. And then you read it every day and every day it's like, well, you know, I'm going to tweak that because in the past week I haven't been living this part of it. And so what allows you to do is kind of keep it in mind. And then you're like, well, I either change my behavior or I change my mission statement. It, it, either one is fine, but it's the idea of reminding yourself of it. And then the other tool is, and what you were kind of talking about, that idea of affirmation. And affirmations come from one of two places, right? It comes from the outside. When, when someone says, you did a great job and I really appreciate that and Anytime we get those, we should, we should save them and, and really savor them. But the other thing is it can come from internally. And a practice that I use uh, with clients and I've used with myself on a number of occasions is this idea of, I'll use the analogy of a junk drawer. So everybody has a junk drawer in their kitchen, which just has a bunch of crap in it, right? And at some point when we moved in, you had a plan for that drawer. You were like, okay, here's where the batteries, the flashlight, the scissors, and this go. And then eventually it collects everything else. But everything that ended up in there ended up with a purpose when it was put there, right? Because it was like, oh, I might need this, put it in there. I don't know where this goes, put it in there. And so the, what I do is part of the process is I take that metaphorical junk drawer and dump it out on the table. 
and we go through everything that's in there. And that's what we're doing with personal attributes, right? So if that's me, I dump it out and it's, Rob, what is every attribute about you? Not good, not bad, just anything. Anything I can think of, anything that's ever been said to me in my life. Okay, well, you're funny. Okay, fine. Well, you're also a smart ass. Yes, okay, those are two different things. Like you can be really generous and you can be kind of greedy sometimes. Okay, put them both down. And so what I do is I go through every piece of the junk drawer, everything that was in the junk drawer, and I identify and then say, is this something I want to keep? Does this have a purpose? And if yes, it goes back in the drawer. And if it doesn't, I get to decide what I want to do with it. Do I throw it out? Do I put it on the side? Do I just acknowledge if it's something where I'm like, eh, I don't know, maybe I want to hold on to this, or it's hard to get rid of? Put it back in the drawer, but you know it's there. And I can ask myself, am I using that thing now incorrectly? And so it, it, what I do is in that process, uh, there's also another way to describe it, which is kind of like a mosaic, right? So if you empty everything that's in yourself, you get nothing but these little pieces. And then you get to kind of reorganize them and create the picture you want. And so I can take all my attributes and reorganize them and say, okay, this is what I look like to me. And that changes how I feel. Like suddenly I can look at it and be like, damn, you're not such a crappy person, Rob. Like, Okay, I feel better. I can, and it allows me to write this down. And then part of the process is identifying all those things that were in the junk drawer and saying, what is still in the drawer and what is getting thrown out? And I can read them every morning and say, I am compassionate. I am no longer, you know, temperamental. And remind myself, hey, when you're temperamental, eh, you agreed not to be that. Like, you're no longer that. Get that out of the junk drawer. And so that's kind of the, that's the process. So those affirmations can come from other people or they can come from within if you take an honest look at yourself. I like that. And, you know, kind of going back to um, that emotional connection, you know, like when you were saying outside, you know, when I'm outside, how was I feeling at that time or whatever, you know, as you're going through your metaphorical junk drawer, you know, okay, this is what I happened here. And this is how I felt when this occasion happened. You know, is that, is that what I want? Is that who I am? Is that what my purpose is? You know, is it what I thought it was going to be? You know, so it, it makes you reflect on like more than one level. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And it also, also kind of creates like an owner's manual for your, for your emotions and your mindset. Because the perfect example, so what you're saying about like the outside, like, well, what does that mean? Does that mean I'd like to be outside? Does that mean, so, and, and so I started to pick it apart. Like, well, when you're on vacation and you're outside every day, because you're out on vacation, you feel great. You don't feel great because you're on vacation. You feel great because you just spent all day outside. Like, oh, okay. So now when I start to think about, hey, I haven't been outside today and I'm kind of in a funk, maybe I should get outside. Like, get outside, go for a walk. Well, I don't have time to go for a walk. Uh, you will when you go outside and you feel better, and then you come back in, you're like, huh, oh, this project is, or this problem is so much easier to solve because I just did something that I know makes me feel better. Like, it's, it's almost like a no-brainer, but it's because it's about feelings instead of, like, hard things to look at, like, analyze. So it doesn't sound like an obvious solution. You know what I mean? And And that's, that's where I spend a lot of time with people too, is working on those habits of, hey, you've got all these great little things that work for you. Now let's figure out how to put them in a toolkit where you can use them. So now when I'm at work and it feels crappy and I feel like nothing's getting done, go outside, you need to go for a walk. Or hey, it's been raining for three days. That's why you feel this way. You know, don't, don't do anything drastic. Like this is, this is why, you know, this is only temporary, so. I love it, you know, and it makes that time, like you said, going outside or not going outside, you know, makes that time of just a change so worth it. You know, like, um, after so long, I've been on the, in front of the computer for 12 hours in one day or whatever. I'm like, I need to go get a drink. So I'll go to the gas station and grab a soda or something, you know, just yeah. to, and then I could come back and I'm like, all right, I'm good. You yeah. know, and then, and then it just, if you let it, it'll just, um, ripple effect positively to all those other aspects and whatnot. And mm -hmm. you know, it's, then, then you feel better, you know, your, your little thing here that you're talking about. Okay. Now let's take on this one. Now let's take on this one. Now let's take on this one. And then pretty soon exactly. you've got that whole thing, you know, in place. And like you said, the, 
the mosaic is coming together instead of a thousand pieces in a box. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Hey, Rob, I, I appreciate this. This has been a phenomenal conversation. You know, um, great having you on here. And, you know, just some, mm -hmm. some phenomenal things shared. So thank you for taking the time. Where can people find you if they wanted to reach out to you to learn more about um, what you do and mm -hmm. how you help them? So I have a website and then you can email me. My website is uh, pat, then the number two, coaching.com, because I talk about taking a second path. Um, and you can email me at rob at pat, the number two, coaching.com. Uh, I'm also on Facebook under Rob Paul, and yeah, but that's the best way to find me is email and, and on the website. Awesome. And we'll also put those links in the description below. Perfect. So. Awesome. Again, thank you, Rob. I appreciate it. And thank yeah. you for joining us. Yep. Thank you, Kenny. Really appreciate it. Take care.